Hello and welcome to Analysis with me, Jonathan Steele. On Monday, three leading pro-democracy activists in Egypt were jailed under a new protest law after losing their appeals, and they were sentenced to three years imprisonment. Meanwhile, elsewhere in Cairo, a heavy police presence has been moved outside the university following clashes between students and authorities. And a number of activists are also having to flee the country to avoid persecution. So we ask today, has Egypt outlawed dissent? In the studio with me to discuss this are Mohammed Sudan, the UK representative of the Freedom and Justice Party, an arm of the Muslim Brotherhood, and Sabah al Mukta, president of the Arab Lawyers Association. Welcome. But before we begin, let's have a look at this video report. On Monday, three leading figures of the 2011 uprisings became the first people to be sentenced for breaching a new controversial protest law, according to which all demonstrations must be authorized by government officials. The defendants, Ahmed Maher and Mohammed Abdel, both activists with the 6th of April youth movement and well-known blogger Ahmed Duma, are to serve three years in prison. We're very disappointed by this verdict, which we believe reflects very poorly on the Egyptian uh, judiciary, which is supposed to be an independent institution and not provide uh, a rubber stamp for government policies. Critics see this case as an attempt to stifle the kind of street activism common since the uprisings that ousted autocrat Hosni Mubarak three years ago. As many as 20,000 people are estimated to have been held since July last year in a sweeping clampdown on the Senate. Amnesty International has also expressed concerns over allegations of torture and detention. These claims are denied by the military-backed interim government. Meanwhile, bomb attacks are becoming increasingly frequent in the streets of Cairo, adding to the climate of fear and instability ahead of next month's elections. As the government presses on with its war on terror and laws on dissent become increasingly draconian, many are left wondering what happened to the spirit of the region. Flaminia Giambalvo, Islam Channel. Well, Sabah al Mukhtar, let me start with you. I mean, you know Egyptian lawyers. Are they independent in any way now, the judiciary, or are they completely under the thumb of the new government? Well, uh, most of the Arab lawyers throughout the Arab world have studied on books by professors from Egypt. Egypt was the leading nation in terms of legislation, in the judiciary, the independence of the judiciary. Uh, something has happened to the Egyptian society. In the first instance, all, uh, all the books we've read on professors of political science and the law and what have you, they seem to have changed their views about what, what we've been taught. Now it is, it is the reverse. Somehow, for instance, uh, they say that the street power overrides the ballot box. And this is a new concept they are coming. The same thing is being applied in the judiciary. Now, I, I have no doubt that most of the judges in Egypt are decent, well-meaning people, they are qualified, they are experienced. However, it only takes a few judges who issue judgments which are so outlandish, you cannot believe it. You have a judge who looks at a, at a thousand accused person and find 529 of them sentence them to death in two days. This man, if he was just flicking papers, let alone talking to people. He wouldn't have been able, he doesn't have the time to do that. Now, this is really one of the very bad things. When we look at the, the case which has been in the, in the report now, had it not been for the U.S. Department who expressed their concern explicitly, the Court of Appeal probably would not have our, uh, upheld the, the appeal. But it is, it is these ideas that some of the judges are issuing judgments which does the judiciary and Egypt disservice. No, but what's the point about the U.S.? Do you mean they feel they have to defy the U.S.? No, you... no the U.S. have objected to the, to the sentences. Condemned. They said they condemned it. Yeah. And they said this is, this is really unacceptable. So now they will have to, rev to change the, the idea and they will probably find a way out by court of cassation or what, however they are going to do that. But they have to do something about it because otherwise it's going to be very difficult to defend. The, the, the Egyptian public are accusing the U.S. and the West of supporting the Brotherhood. And, and has the U.S. also condemned the case that you mentioned about the 529 sentence to yes, death? They, yes, they did, but not in the same tone, not in the same way, not in the same strength. This one, they, they explicitly put the names 
They said the state, the, the sentences, and they said this is out, outrageous. How can you sentence people to these lengths for expressing a view, which is uh, unacceptable by any staff? So it is. This situation is making the West feel embarrassed on these principles. I suppose principles. the question that arises then: Who decides? that this judge will sit on this case because you said this, this judge is incredible. How could he have done it? Well, who said that this will be the judge for this case? Well, there is absolutely no doubt that it is the administration, it is the government itself, because they are choosing certain judges to look into certain cases. So when you end up that Mubarak is almost exonerated from everything and Morsi is going to be found guilty of everything, you know how it is being done. It is the, uh, the, the executive is making the judiciary select the people they want. And, they, and we, we had also the problem when Morsi was there over the, the, the uh, general prosecutor, that whether he should stay or he should go and some of the judges changes. So there is an interference from the executive well, into the judiciary. Well, let me Mohammed Sudan from the Freedom and Justice Party on exactly that point. I mean, in the, in the uh, year or so that Mohammed Morsi was the president, yeah. Was it the same thing that the, 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 the administration, his administration, decided who would be the judge in a particular case? And was it clear that there was political interference? Actually, in the era of Mohammed Morsi, he was um, very, very away from the judiciary. The judiciary should be fully independent. That was his strategy. He never select or do something like this in any kind of, uh, of, of the cases. Uh, for instance, when one of the journalists, the, the judge put him uh, or arrest him, and then he wants to change that because he doesn't like to any journalist, he wants to have a free speech in Egypt. And then he um, issued a new law that there is no any temporary arresting for all the journalists, but not for a specific case. Then he made it like a general um, low for, for all the journalists, no um, temporary arresting for the older journalists in Egypt. That is a law. And then this one being released in that time. Um, uh, uh, other thing is that the way which Mubarak used against his opposition, especially the Muslim Brotherhood, select specific judges and then to send uh, the people or his uh, opposition to these judges or this. Uh, court, and then this something like a deal. But when it's something uh, more, they, they did not implement his desire. For instance, the 40 people um, in 2007 case uh, of Muslim Brotherhood, and then when the, the, uh, the civil uh, judiciary released them, all of them, 40 people in that time, and then he switched the case to the military court. And then they gave them like seven and a five and three year sentences for, for some of them in that time, and at least some of them, the, the military uh, court. That is the way. But now I'm really wondering what's happened for the Egyptian judiciary. CC and all the military authority, the military court authority, they could change the faith of the Egyptian judiciary. Now we have more. In, in, in the era of Mubarak, only 22 judges. He used to use them against his oppositions, not only the Muslim Brotherhood, but all his opposition. But now they are more than that. I believe this reason because of the judiciary was a part for the conspiracy against the legitimacy in Egypt. Because of Morsi wants to change the law of the judiciary law, and he wants to stop a lot of corruption in the judiciary in Egypt. For an instance, that. Let, let, let me, before you give the example, okay. let, let me just turn to Saba right. about that. I mean, do you agree with that, that Morsi was on the whole less repressive than either Mubarak or, or the present? Government. Certainly he does, but uh, one has to understand the reason. Morsi had no power over anybody because Morsi inherited the deep state. He, ha he came to power when all the establishment, whether it's the army or the police or the judiciary or the banks or the economy, everything was Media. still Mubarak's time. That's why he, everything, all the, all the wheels stopped working. So he did not interfere into the judiciary. I don't know his motives, but he could not have done so because he didn't have the influence within the state. So he was the president when all the establishment was against him. 
everything, including the judiciary. We had we had the situation where where the he he couldn't, although it is within his power as president to replace some of the you know the crown prosecution service or the the the, uh, the prosecution service, he was banned from doing it, uh, and he had all the judiciary come standing against him for saying he's interfering. So he did not interfere because he couldn't, not because he didn't want to. Probably if he would have stayed. Now, I think, generally speaking, he was trying actually to change the scenery, i.e. to restore back the independence of the judiciary, which was lost during Mubarak's time. That one was thwarted. And I think now it's gone even much worse than what it was under Mubarak. No, I'm, I'm sorry, and I think that I know as well. I was very close to that. I know that Mr. Morsi, he was insist to let the judiciary independent, 100 percent. Yeah, but I think that's what you were saying. He, yeah, he said that he could not. He could not do it. Yeah. But there are differences between he could do it and, and he wants to do it. Right. First, by changing the, um, the general attorney. Uh, Talat Ibrahim, and, that, uh, and then the, the, the wide was all them against that, because this one was covering a lot of corruption in the judiciary. And when he wants to, and he did it, and he changed it. But we, we saw that how many people that they raised their gun against the, the uh, general attorney in Egypt. That was something w never happened before. Well, let's yeah. deal with the big question that I asked okay. at the beginning, which is, yes. has Egypt outlawed dissent? I mean, if it's now very difficult to protest in public without getting permission, and they probably won't give you permission, yeah. if you cannot um, argue against the ref in the referendum for a no vote, which was also illegal, it seems, uh, what can you do if you don't agree with the government's policy? Actually, if you if you watch the the Gal Jazeera or whatever they could uh, do it from uh, broadcast it uh, in Egypt, you find every day a lot of protest inside the university, out the university, in in all of the provinces in Egypt. It's still there without permission. The, the Egyptian people are against the military coup authority, and they they still insist to go in the protesting against this coup, and then they don't care if they go to prison, if they're going to be arrested, if they're being killed even. They don't care because they don't want it, their dignity and democracy and their freedom back. They insist. They don't care about this. I mean, do you see any scope for no, I think opposition now? Certainly, I think ban, uh, Egypt has banned everything, to the extent that even uh, people who can, like Basim, the person who makes jokes about Morsi, can't make jokes about, about uh, Sisi, Sisi, you have a situation where you, you cannot demonstrate, you cannot write, you cannot do anything. Most of the media were closed, most of the newspapers were closed, you have the highest number of detained journalists, you have the law which bans people from talking. Uh, in fact, although people are violating the law, but in fact, under the current law, if you apply it, any five people standing on the corner of the street, they are breaking the law. Five people. Five people. <laughs> this is this is a, at the present moment. That is the law. You cannot you cannot do that. You cannot go on a demonstration. You cannot do anything. You cannot without the permission. So the they have all but banned. But the worst problem you have in Egypt is that there is the this demonization of a large portion of the population. It doesn't matter whether they have 10% or 70% or 30%. There are supporters of that movement which was involved in the election. Suddenly, it moved from a, a, the majority of the population in terms of voting into becoming all terrorists. And this is, this is a thing which has not been done before. Uh, uh, Jamal Abdel Nasser hung their leaders, Mubarak uh, arrested them, but neither of them demonize the whole movement. It is this one. So it is not only the right of expression, but even the disenfranchising of a very large swathe of the society. And it doesn't matter what they do. Anybody who has the, if they make the sign of Flabia, or if they wear yellow, or if they are brotherhood, or they criticize, immediately you are labeled as a terrorist. And this is where we have the problem in Egypt. And this is where the Egyptians. Now, what can they do about it? Here in England, if people may remember when we had the inner city rioting, we had Lord Scarman who was looking at this. And Lord Scarman at the time said, it is the perception. If, if people feel that they are, they are being abused and they believe that they have no redress, then they are people in the corner 
and they will behave like a people, like a person in the corner. That's why we have now the escalation of violence, you have the escalation of terrorism in Egypt, explosions, people are using firearms. You, and this is when you, when you feel that you have no more a right to redress. But, uh, but what about the sort of, you know, the secular liberal people? Because at the time of the coup last July, oh, they were all in favour of it and saying, oh, yes, it's the, really important to thank God for the army that came in, etc. That is the biggest disaster. But now with the jailing of these three people who are not brotherhood, they're young protesters, they were Tahrir Square heroes and all the rest of it. Surely this liberal secular group now will be realizing that uh, this is a very different regime than they expected. Well, they realized this right from the outset, but because they have tied themselves to the military, they were the people, because the identity became, if you are against the Brotherhood, then you are fine. It doesn't matter whether it's the army or the Israelis or the Americans or the other Arabs, it doesn't matter. As long as you are against the Brotherhood, it's fine. They knew that, but I think the, and I have a problem with my fellow liberals, the socialists, the communists, the Nasserists, the Baathists, all those people. We've been talking for the last 30, 50 years about democracy and freedom and we don't want the army, and suddenly you had an elected government, albeit a bad government in our view, but we shouldn't be moving back again to a situation which is worse than what it was under Mubarak. But the liberal movement, are, they have now realized they thought that they had the backing of the people, and they realized they have no backing, so they became bad losers. And that's why they are sticking by their gun. So they're keeping quiet, basically. I mean, do, do you see them as your allies, or do you put any weight on the liberal actually, secular not, people? Actually, they are not keeping, keeping quiet. They are now against the, the military coup. For instance, these three guys, Ahmed Maher and Muhammad Adil and Ahmed Doma. They were in the 30th of June in Tahrir Square against Morsi's regime and with the military coup. And now they understood that the, it's fake revolution and they were in, in, they were fall in the trick of the military. And they are, when they sign up that they are against the military, then they send them right away to the jail. This is the system. Either you be with me, then you're free. If you are against me, you are behind bars. This is the system. No freedom, no free speech. Well, what do you think will happen in the upcoming presidential election? Will there be any credible alternative to General Sisi? This is going to be like one uh, candidate race. It's not a, a it's not a, a, a election. Sisi will be the single one. It's going to be a, a sole uh, election. No, the, the, and then we were going to see a lot of people go to the ballot boxes because the, he, he will pay for them or enforce them or belong to Mubarak's regime because all the Mubarak regime who had the benefits from the corruption, they need to get this era back. And Sisi is belong to this group. Well, on that note, we'll have to end this section of the program. When we come back, we're going to be talking about David Cameron's decision to have an investigation of the activities of the Muslim Brotherhood in Britain. So stay with us.